Welcome back to week 5 of our course, Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. This is the third lecture for this week. Now in the last lecture, we introduced this Hadamard gate and this magical property that when you apply it once on a delta function, you know, where the amplitude is non-zero only for a particular component, when you apply it once to a delta function, you spread it out over all the components. That's a delta becomes a h, but you apply it a second time, you again get back the delta. And this is the property that is widely used in many quantum circuits. And we'll, in this lecture, we'll talk about the Grover's algorithm, which makes use of this property and others and some others. That's what we'll talk about. Now, Grover's search, the problem is something like this, that we have a database with small n bits, which can host like capital N, which is two to the power n configurations. And of these two to the power n configurations, there is one which is the correct answer. That's the target that we want to find. We need to find which of these two to the power n configurations is the right one. And as you know, as small n increases, capital N increases exponentially. So that with say 40 bits, you could have like a trillion configurations, a lot to search from. Now classically, how many tries would you need? Well, the idea is that you'd go at it sequentially. You could say, okay, is this the right one? No. Is this the right one? No. Till you get a yes. If you're lucky, your first query would be the right one. So you'd have your answer in one query. If you're unlucky, it would take you n queries. On the average, it would be half of n. The point is it is of the order of n. Whereas what Grover's algorithm gives us is a way to get an answer in square root of n queries, which can be a huge improvement when n is large. So how does this work? Well, to start with, we use this Hadamard gate. We, and for this discussion, let's say we got two qubits, n is equal to two, which has four configurations. But the way we go through this discussion, you'll see it applies to any arbitrary number really. But just for concreteness, we are putting down two, two bits. Okay, so the composite Hadamard matrix, applying, working on this two qubit system, will be written by the Kronecker product of the two UH. And that's what I'll write with a big, bold UH here. Now, if you come in with a zero, zero, so if the initial wave function looks like plus one, zero, 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 then after applying the Hadamard gate, you get this first column. So what you'd get then would look like one, 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 and then one over square root of n and which in this case would have been one over square root of four, which is half, but to keep it general, I'm writing one over square root of n. Now comes the query. So what does the query do? The, what it does is that when you ask for the answer about the target, what, it, what this circuit will do for you is it will flip the sign of the target. So all of these were plus one, so one of these will become minus one. Now, if this were a course on quantum computing, of course, the next question we'd be discussing is, how do you build the circuit that does this query? Can you do it with just a few circuits of the order of small n, or would you need like two to the power n circuits to do it? But these are questions we won't go into. Actually, it's a fairly straightforward circuit using what are called controlled gates that you could use to implement this, but we won't go into that. Okay. But the point is, supposing we had this circuit which flips the sign of the target every time we query it, how could we then identify the target? Because just flipping the sign doesn't help me. Because you see, in the end, when I make any measurement, I measure probabilities. I don't measure amplitudes. So the fact that this amplitude is minus one doesn't mean a thing, because as far as probabilities are concerned, all four look equally probable. So I can't really tell what happened. 
So what happens next is there's a sequence of gates that are applied which turn this simple flipping into actually a measurable thing, which means what happens after I apply these three gates, which I'll explain, the target becomes enhanced relative to the background and the background is suppressed a little bit. Of course, if any one is enhanced, the rest must be suppressed in order to keep the nor normalization right because overall the sum of squares must be one. So the point is every time you run this, the amplitude of the target, the correct answer, goes from one over root n to three over root n. That's what I'll show how that happens, not obvious. And so in every cycle, this enhancement occurs. And if you apply the enhancement a number of times, then finally the target amplitude will become big enough that you'll be easily able to detect it. And how many would you need? Well, since it goes up by like square root of n every time, by two over square root of n, it means you need something like square root of n applications, cycles, to build it up to one, at which point, of course, you couldn't miss it. In practice, I guess if you plot this, so here I've plotted how many cycles you need. What I'm plotting here is the amplitude of the target as a function of the number of cycles. And if you have, say, six bits, then you can see the number of cycles goes up to one rather quickly in less than 10 cycles, and then actually comes down again. If you look at, if you had eight bits, it goes, takes about 20 cycles. If you, if you have 10 bits, it takes about little less than 30 cycles. And roughly you can see that the peak value occurs when the number of cycles is square root of capital N. So you see, with six bits, capital N is like 64, square root is eight. So it takes about eight cycles, a little less. If you had eight, that's like 256 con configurations, capital N, square root is 16. 10 is like 1024, and square root is 32. That's about the number of cycles it takes. So that's the thing. The Grover iteration then, the number of cycles, which means the number of queries, is of the order of square root of capital N, which is a big improvement over the classical answer, which is that you need of the order of capital N queries. Okay. So how does this work? So we are starting with the delta zero, right? So we start with something that's in the zero state and using our notation, that's what we have named delta zero. It's a only non-zero element is the first one. When you apply a Hadamard on it, what happens is this property, as you know, as we have discussed in the last lecture, what the Hadamard does is it turns the delta into a H and the H into a delta. So delta zero becomes H zero. That's this first column, essentially. Now, what does the query do? Well, the query does something that's not so easily written because it takes the target element and flips it. But what you could do is write it as a superposition of the, the H zero that we had, where all of them were plus, and from which you have subtracted minus two for the target. So it is as if you had H zero before and you subtract from it this delta T, you know, something which has a non-zero element only for the target. So you could use this notation then to write the answer you get after querying is H zero minus two over root N delta T, okay? That's what the query does. Next, we have the Hadamard acting on it. What does that do? Well, as we have discussed, Hadamard takes delta and turns it into H, takes H and turns it into a delta. So H zero now becomes delta zero and delta T becomes H T. Simple, okay. Next, we have a, this U zero gate and its job is to flip the sign of all the elements except for the first one. So the first one stays what it is, but all the elements are flipped. Again, 
if this was a course about quantum computing, we'd talk about the kind of circuits you could use to actually do that. Again, you'd need one of these controlled gates, but we won't go into it. Now, when you, but question is, what does that do to this, what we had? Well, if you think about it, the delta zero is unaffected. Why? Because delta zero, the only non-zero element is the first one, and we are doing nothing to the first one anyway. First one is plus one, stays plus one. Now, what about the HT? Well, HT has all elements, and if you just flipped the sign of all the elements, what, would, what that would mean is minus 2 HT over root n would become plus 2 HT over root n, if you just flipped all the signs. But then, you flipped all the signs except for the first one. So, you need another term to account for the fact that you didn't flip the first one. And you can show that that one actually amounts to uh, uh, subtracting this delta zero, which is this element that only has a non-zero element in the first, first position. And this 4 over n kind of comes from 2 over root n squared. So what you can show is that the effect of flipping all elements except the first turns this delta 0 minus 2 over root n ht into delta 0 plus 2 ht over root n, and then subtracts a little bit. Now we have the Hadamard working on it, and that's again easy because Hadamard's turned deltas into h and h's into delta. So at the end of the day, you have the delta 0 becomes h0, and you have 1 minus 4 over n, and then the ht becomes delta t, so you have 2 delta t over root n. So now you can see the role of the two terms. You see h0 is plus 1 everywhere. That's the background. And what has happened is the background got reduced a little bit. And then delta t, that's the target. That's this one that has a plus 1 only on the target bit, the one we are looking for. And that gets enhanced by 2 over root n. So that's what we had said uh, a Grover cycle does. It enhances the amplitude of the target one from 1 over root n to 3 over root n. So every cycle it enhances it like this and suppresses the background. Now just to recap then, if you look at the matrices that, accompl that accomplish it, well we have a u0 matrix here, whose job is to flip the sign of everything except the first one. That's the plus one here. Rest are all minus one. And then we have the query, whose job is to just flip the sign of the target. And then, of course, we have the Hadamard that we have discussed at length. And the Hadamard, as you know, it is this Kronecker product of individual Hadamards. So if you scale it up, like if you had 10 bits, you'd have a Kronecker of 10 of these. But nice thing is, each one of these is a two by two operation involving two qubits. And if you do it separately on all 10 of them, you have effectively implemented this entire matrix, which is two to the power 10 by two to the power 10. Now, again, if this were a course on quantum computing, we'd now talk about how to implement these transformations. And question is, would it, require of the order of n circuits or would it require 2 to the power n? Because if it's 2 to the power n, it's no use because then that would take all your time. But the point is these can be done easily with what are called controlled gates, although we won't go into it. So to sum up then, we just discussed one good, one nice example of example of a quantum algorithm that makes use of Hadamard gates and, com and combines it with other ideas to perform something useful, namely how to search a database in with number of with the time that goes a square root of n rather than n. Next lecture, we'll talk about another seminal algorithm in the quantum literature that's called Shor's algorithm. Thank you.